Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on June 6th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. A recent decision by the Supreme Court of the United States could have a major impact on wetlands across the country. And here in Florida, we'll find out why some people worry it could lead to more development and construction on wetlands. And I'd like to hear from you. Do you agree with the Supreme Court's decision? And how do you think it will impact wetlands and development in Florida? You can call in at 813-239-9663. You can email DJ at WMNF.org, or you can text 813-433-0885. And I want to welcome our guest, land use, attor land use attorney, environmental and property rights attorney, Dave Smolker. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Dave. Well, thank you, Sean. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. I'm really glad that you could join us. And before we talk about the impact, let's start out with a little bit of background about this specific case that the U.S. Supreme Court heard. What brought this case to the Supreme Court? Well, it has an interesting history that really stretches back all the way to the early 70s. Um, factually, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Sackett bought property in Idaho that had a small wetland on it, um, and there was a nearby lake to which it was connected by a ditch. And they began backfilling so that they could build a single family home. Uh, the EPA cited them for illegal discharge of pollutants uh, of waters of the United States under the Clean Water Act. And they threatened them with fines of up to $40,000 a day until they removed the fill and restored the property. Um, the wetlands were on a lot that was near a ditch that fed a creek that ultimately fed to an intrastate navigable lake. In other words, it was a lake that was entirely located within a single state. The EPA claimed jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act based on an ecologically significant nexus test. Uh, that test basically said that um, as long as there was a significant ecological nexus to a traditional navigable water of the United States, then the Corps uh, of Engineers and the EPA had permitting jurisdiction. So the issue that was before the court was whether the significant ecological nexus test was the proper test of federal wetland jurisdiction. Now, from a historical standpoint, traditionally, the United States exercised regulatory permitting jurisdiction over navigable waters of the United States under the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution. They did so to essentially prevent obstructions to navigation pursuant to the Rivers and Harbors Act. Uh, in the late 1960s, the Army Corps of Engineers began basing their permitting decisions under the Rivers and Harbors Act on fish and wildlife conservation values. Uh, this was sort of coincident with the rise of environmental regulation in the late 60s and early 70s. Now, during this same time period, pollution of navigable waters of the United States actually had reached fairly severe levels. Uh, the poster child for this problem was the Cuyahoga River in Ohio, which actually caught fire due to accumulation of pollutants at the surface of the river. Um, so in 1972, Congress enacted the Clean Water Act, and they prohibited discharge of pollutants, for example, fill material, um, into the waters of the United States without a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers. Now, uncertainty as to the exact definition of waters of the United States led to decades of litigation, varying interpretations by the Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA, and ultimately, a very expansive uh, assertion of jurisdiction uh, over wetlands under the Clean Water Act. Now, it's, a, it's significant that waters of the United States were traditionally defined as navigable waters. And so the EPA and the Corps of Engineers uh, initially defined the term broadly to encompass all waters that could affect interstate commerce. And that included wetlands that were adjacent to navigable waters. And that's really what was at issue um, in the Sackett case was the extent to which that jurisdiction applied to adjacent uh, wetlands. Now, ultimately, the, Corps, uh, the United States Supreme Court upheld this interpretation, at which time the Corps then extended that reach uh, of, a, of what we would call adjacency to include any waters that could be used as habitat for migratory birds, which had the effect of taking in isolated ponds, and other wetlands that were located 
entirely within a single state. Query, what's the relationship of that to interstate commerce? But because birds could fly and they migrated, that was considered to be a sufficient um, con connection to allow assertion of jurisdiction. Now, the Supreme Court rejected that interpretation to the extent that the ponds were not actually adjacent to open navigable waters. Um, thereafter, the EPA extended their jurisdiction to include 270 to 300 million acres of wetlands, as long as the lands contained a channel or a conduit which rainwater or drainage could intermittently flow. Uh, again, this reached the Supreme Court of the United States and they rejected such an expansive definition, but they were unable to reach a majority consensus as to exactly what the outer limits of jurisdiction of the Corps and the EPA was under the Clean Water Act. Justice Kennedy um, wrote a concurring opinion in which he proposed what's been referred to as the ecologically significant nexus test, uh, which basically said if there was an ecological nexus of significance between the wetland and ultimately a navigable water body, then it would be jurisdictional. The effect of that was the Corps and the EPA started applying that test and it effectively reached virtually all waters and wetlands in the United States. And so um, the test also involved consideration of a wide variety of open-ended um, ecological factors. So it became a case-by-case -case determination and effectively um, that determination could reach pretty much any wetland in the United States. Um, so the Sackett decision really poised or posed that question squarely. And interestingly enough, all nine justices in the Sackett decision rejected EPA's application of the significant nexus test. Um, <clears throat> however, there were three, actually four separate opinions. Seems like all the justices wanted to weigh in on that case. And it became a question of who would be able to get five votes. So the majority opinion, which is now the law of the land, um, uh, expressed concern with the expansive, vague, open-ended reach and scope of the significant ne nexus test. Um, when compared to the traditional interpretation of waters of the United States as being navigable. Uh, they also expressed concern with the severe criminal and civil penalties for what amounted to relatively mundane activities. Um, and they concluded that the Clean Water Act's use of the term waters applied only to relatively permanent standing or continuously flowing bodies of water that formed streams, lakes, rivers, and oceans. Uh, they essentially applied a plain language sort of test to what waters meant. They then went on to conclude that such wetlands that would be adjacent to such water bodies would only be subject to jurisdiction if they qualified as waters in their own right, and as a practical matter would be indistinguishable from navigable waters of the U.S. So under their decision, uh, to assert jurisdiction over wetlands that are adjacent to navigable waters, EPA and the Corps of Engineers must now show that the body of water is adjacent, that the body of water that's adjacent to a wetland is a water of the United States, i.e. it's a relatively permanent body of water that's connected to traditional interstate navigable waters. And then the wetland has to have a continuous surface water connection with the water, making it difficult to tell where the water ends and where the wetland begins. In other words, basically you had to be able to say that the wetland adjoined a navigable water of the United States with a surface water connection that made the two more or less indistinguishable um, or at least difficult to tell the difference. Um, so that, it was a significant narrowing of the scope of assertion of jurisdiction by the federal government over what had previously existed. It's significant because it's the first time that we really have had a five justice majority to tell us exactly what is the jurisdiction of the federal government when it comes to regulating wetlands. Now, interestingly, there were three other opinions, concurring opinions. As I noted, all nine justices uh, felt that the uh, particular assertion of jurisdiction in the Sackett case was not proper. It was too broad and too expansive. Um, 
Justice Thomas wrote a concurring opinion, which was joined in by Justice Gorsuch, such, and he joined in full, but he elaborated as to his view, which would probably be an even more narrow view of the traditional navigable waters test. And he kind of bemoaned the fact that he felt that um, even uh, historically, that in the case of environmental regulations, that Congress had essentially gone beyond the narrow confines of the Commerce Clause, which is the basis for congressional environmental laws. Um, there has to be uh, a connection to interstate commerce. And I think he took a, a, an even more narrow view uh, of it, but he did join the opinion in full. Um, additionally, uh, Justices Kagan and Sotomayor and Jackson uh, felt that the majority was sort of tilting the playing field in favor of property owners by requiring that the wetland adjoin, abut, touch, or be contiguous to a traditional navigable water of the United States. And they would find that there would be jurisdiction if um, the wetland was nearby, i.e. it didn't have to adjoin, it just had to be adjacent. The so these two terms, adjoining and adjacent, really become kind of the fulcrum uh, for how the courts were viewing this. And interestingly enough, you know, adjoining really means contiguous. Adjacent can mean not necessarily contiguous, but nearby. And although the definition of adjoining also includes adjacent. So you can see you're getting into this fuzzy area, um, which, you know, the Supreme Court's famous for uh, dealing with. And so Justice Kavanaugh um, wrote uh, uh, an opinion also where he kind of elaborated on this distinction, and it was joined in by Justices Kagan, Sotomayor, and Jackson. And he disagreed with the idea that there had to be a continuous surface water connection. Um, he felt that the term adjacent could have a meaning beyond just adjoining, and that therefore um, adjacent extended to wetlands that might be separated from a covered water, i.e. a navigable water, by a man-made dike or a barrier or a natural river berm or a beach dune or the like. And, and his concern was, uh, you know, arguably legitimate that if you required that there be a continu con continuous surface water connection, that that could actually have adverse impacts on certain significant areas of public interest, such as flood control and um, protection of water quality. And so his, his opinion, um, really hinges on this idea that the term adjacent shouldn't be limited to just contiguous um, with a surface water connection, but it should also apply to nearby wetlands. So that's kind of where we stand. I mean, the, it's a very significant case in terms of finally having a five justice majority telling us exactly what the scope of the jurisdiction is. And I think in my experience, this is the clearest most easily uh, applicable definition of what that jurisdiction is. Um, so any of that, um, it's a major decision. Um, and, um, you know, as far as the impact that it could have on Florida, um, well, first of all, it's important to remember that I think by last count, there's at one point in time, there was close to 30 million acres of wetlands in Florida. And as we all know, just driving around, there's a lot of wetlands in Florida. Um, Florida already, excuse me, regulates wetlands at the state level that includes discharge of fill um, into what are called waters of the state. Waters of the state are more broadly defined than the, the US Supreme Court's decision in the Sackett case. It includes, but is not limited to, rivers, lakes, streams, springs, impoundments, and all other waters or bodies of water, including fresh, brackish, saline, tidal surface, or even underground waters. Now, that includes what are called isolated wetlands, which I think in almost all circumstances are not going to be jurisdictional now under the Sackett decision under the Federal Clean Water Act. However, under Florida law, um, isolated wetlands are included within uh, the meaning of regulated wetlands, and that would include swamps, um, marshes, bayheads, bogs, uh, 
hydric seepage slopes, uh, tidal marshes, mangrove swamps, and other similar type areas. Now, what's also interesting is that Florida has received a delegation from the Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA of Clean Water Act permitting authority. So in other words, the, our state deep Department of Environmental Protection now enforces both the state environmental resource protection regulation, as well as the core um, Clean Water Act jurisdiction. And um, exactly how that's working is probably up to debate. Um, you know, it's, it's another layer of, uh, of regulatory uh, responsibility that has now been assumed by the state in most instances. Um, and so the question is, is Sackett case really going to fundamentally alter wetland regulation in Florida? And, you know, the jury's not out and uh, smarter people than me are probably looking at this question right now. And we probably will start getting some direction here from the DEP as far as what their opinion is. Um, but I don't think it's likely to fundamentally alter wetland regulation in Florida, primarily because of the environmental resource permitting program that we already have in place that's really more expansive than um, the core jurisdiction and regulatory authority would be um, under the Sackett decision. But there could be some potentially significant repercussions. Um, we're certainly given Florida's kind of unique uh, flat, wet uh, geography, there's likely to be a lot of wetlands that are no longer subject to federal jurisdiction. Um, now, they'll still be subject to environmental resource protection regulation. Um, but there will be essentially a large areas of wetlands now that in Florida that will be outside of core regulation. And I'm sure that um, certainly uh, the development community is going to be happy about that because they used to, uh, uh, well, historically would have to go through both permitting exercises and often you could get approval from the state and then you could be denied by the Corps. Some of that is going away with the delegation, but it's still out there. Um, another uh, change would be it's probably going to be less complicated and burdensome to go through the wetland permitting process for those wetlands that are no longer core jurisdictional because it's one less regulatory framework that the Department of Environmental Protection is gonna to have to apply in deciding whether to approve uh, filling of wetlands. Another issue is historically under uh, the state regulation and federal regulation, they had different wetland mitigation requirements. Um, mitigation is an option that's available if the wetland impacts are considered to be not permittable without making offsets. And so you've been allowed to mitigate for wetland impacts as a way of getting a permit to impact those wetlands. Um, and the, the mitigation requirements are somewhat different. Um, I think the Corps' um, mitigation requirements are more stringent than the state's. Um, and so for those wetlands that are no longer going to be subject to core jurisdiction, presumably um, there will be uh, a simpler and potentially less um, conflicting mitigation program where you do uh, have wetland permits uh, that you have to obtain. So I think, you know, again, the jury is, is sort of out on what the effect could be in Florida. Um, but I think in the long run, um, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact because of the fact that the the state's ERP program, Environmental Resource Protection Program, is already broader than federal jurisdiction um, under Sackett. And so those wetlands that might be excluded from federal jurisdiction are still going to be included within the jurisdiction of the Department of Environmental Protection and the Water Management Districts. So that's, um, that's kind of the 50,000 foot summary. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions if, if your guests have, have any. Yeah, I want to remind people that my guest is land use attorney Dave Smolker, and we're talking about the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision on wetlands jurisdiction, Sackett versus EPA. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. We're live on June 6th, and if you'd like to call in with a question, it's 813-239-9663. You can also email 813-239-9663. 
dj at wmnf.org, or you can text 813-433-0885. And Dave, you were just talking a minute ago about mitigation and offsets, and that uh, raises a question that was emailed into us from uh, from David. He says, um, uh, he was thinking about the mitigation parks that have popped up in the Fort Myers area and do mitigation efforts help or hinder the environment? And again, to, to remind people, mitigation is what developers can do to make up for natural wetlands that they've filled in. They can create these artificial wetlands. So do they help or hinder the environment is what David is asking. Well, I think the answer to that question is uh, it depends. Um, the success of mitigation is often um, an important factor, um, and that in turn really depends on the nature of the mitigation. If you are creating wetlands um, out of uh, areas that uh, are not currently wetlands or you're restoring areas that were wetlands that have been disturbed, um, there is a requirement that you achieve success. And I think that the regulatory agencies would probably suggest that that success is sort of sometimes a 50-50 proposition, uh, that you don't really get a full and complete um, mitigation. Um, one of the areas that I think is, I personally think is effective is the idea of preservation, um, where you take um, ecologically valuable lands and you set them aside and preserve them in perpetuity um, for their natural features and values. And um, interestingly enough, the core traditionally has frowned upon preservation as a method of uh, mitigation, while the state of Florida, um, although it's fair, still fairly uh, stringent in terms of the ratios, does accept um, preservation as a method of, uh, of mitigation. So presumably here, where you have large amounts of excluded wetlands no longer covered by federal law, uh, the, the, the process of preserving lands for mitigation purposes um, will actually be um, less problematic uh, because you won't have to worry about mitigating under the Army Corps of Engineers mitigation standards for the wetlands that are being impacted that are excluded from the federal definition. So uh, like I said, I think it's kind of a mixed bag, but uh, I think one potential advantage of the SACA decision is that it will be easier to preserve um, ecologically sensitive lands um, as mitigation for wetland impacts. And regarding that Sackett versus EPA decision by the Supreme Court of the United States, as you mentioned earlier, conservative justice Brett Kavanaugh kind of sided in a way with three liberal justices who he was a little bit concerned that the Clean Water Act would be weakened by the, the way that the a court ultimately decided, and he wrote that the decision could have significant repercussions for water quality and flood control in the country. So if Brett Kavanaugh, I, I don't mean to stereotype or anything, but if Brett Kavanaugh is concerned that there could be significant repercussions now for water quality and flood control, now that this decision has come out, what does that say about what, what, what how could it impact uh, water quality and flood, flood control? That gets back to the uh, mysterious definition of adjoining as compared to adjacent, which they can be they can mean the same or they can be different. And I think Justice Kavanaugh felt that, um, along with Justices Kagan, Sotomayor, and Jackson, that there sort of should have been kind of a almost a presumption in favor of trying to achieve the broader objectives of the Clean Water Act, which would include flood control and water quality. And I agree um, with Justice Kavanaugh that he has a valid point. Um, and depending on, um, well, ultimately, it's really a, a, a question that Congress should answer. Uh, the Supreme Court has, has, has weighed in. And um, I guess, in the final analysis, we'll have to wait and see how the Corps and the EPA interpret uh, the Sackett case. Um, there may be ways to sort of harmonize um, Justice Kavanaugh's uh, opinion with, with the uh, majority, 
um, I'm sure that people are taking a hard look at that because I think he makes valid points, in my opinion. Could it be, and uh, you know, I, I can't say I know the answer to this, so I'm legitimately asking uh, to find out a potential answer is, if, if you're in a floodplain, let, let's say like along one of these rivers, for example, in uh, Lithia right now, there's a there's a potential for floods because of all the rain we've gotten. But if you're in a floodplain where there's not water there, uh, development in that water would really only impact things when it floods, which is potentially often in a floodplain. Uh, so would, would it make it easier potentially to develop in a floodplain where there's not standing wetlands, where there's not necessarily a, a, a contiguous a uh, body of water nearby, but it it's flooded sometimes by these navigable waters. Could it, could it make development easier there? I think the answer to that question is again, it depends uh, on where you are. Um, in Florida, I'm not sure it's going to make much difference because the Florida's um, Environmental Resource Protection Regulation deals both with quality and quantity. And if you fill within a wetland or a floodplain, you're obligated to um, provide what's called compensating storage, all right, which means somewhere within that general basin, you've got to essentially create flood storage capacity equal to what you just displaced with your fill. So I think in Florida, it's probably not going to be a huge problem. However, in other states where they have, you know, significant flooding issues um, and they don't have state regulation of that sort of, of filling within those areas, it could well be an issue. I want to remind people that our guest is land use attorney Dave Smolker, and we're talking about the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision on wetlands jurisdiction. It's called Sackett versus EPA. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. We're live on June 6th, and I want to go to a, a, hopefully a quick call from John in Palmetto. John, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. well, no, actually, I have a statement to make. I mean, I've, I've reported on this for years and years and years, and almost everything this gentleman has said is just off the map wrong. It, it is going to be the, it's, it's, I mean, we're already doomed here in Florida because they, they have different ways. I mean, Baruch was the head of Swift Mud, and he used to, he was count he used to count nine thousand acres, which were really the retention ponds on the Veterans Expressway, as wetlands. You know, if, if that's a cartoon, we have we have mitigated it uh, it away with the UMAM. Uh, uh, we set up probably about I think it was around ten years ago. It, we we've got it down, and and we've got a governor that's going, that's got a flag saying developers, this is your place. You know, 30, 30 million people is almost a death wish for Florida because of the water, the sensitive water situation. Uh, you know, everything this gentleman is saying is is pro. I mean, we don't have a problem, problem with uh, with wetlands. Who 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 objects? Who fights the more than mosaic? I'm sure that this way here we're listening we're listening to, not speaking to the gentleman, but that that the, the, from where he's coming from. Is, uh, is 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 understands exactly what I'm saying, and and uh, and there's nothing to argue there. Uh, you know, there's there's so so many people around the country that have participated in the last 20 years of this fight. It's collected, you know, hundreds of thousands of documents. None of them. None of them. John, none thanks. Of them Let me see what our our guest how he responds to that. So, uh, uh, so Dave, John is saying that uh, that. You know, maybe he was talking about the wetlands mitigation there, but um, he's, you know, uh, I don't know your thoughts on on that that call. Uh, well, I, I didn't get the full gist of what he was saying. Um, if if I'm understanding it as the current ERP regulatory system isn't adequate, uh, I think you can point to examples of where it's worked, and you can point to examples of where it hasn't worked. Um, you know, I'm just a country lawyer from Long Island. Um, you know, I, I follow the rule of law uh, that other people make, and um, there's gray areas, and you have to interpret them. Um, from a policy standpoint, um, I think what I heard was that the gentleman seemed to just simply be opposed to the idea of impacting wetlands. Um, and that's certainly a legitimate 
position to take, but there are legal consequences, of course, because in our constitutional structure of government here, um, people are allowed to make economically beneficial use of their property. Um, and if the government doesn't want people to be able to do that, well, they can pass a law that says you can't do that. But then there's this pesky provision called the Fifth Amendment, the United States Constitution, that says that you have to pay people for taking their property. So I, uh, I think it's kind of a mixed bag if I'm interpreting the gentleman correctly. Um, and then ultimately, I think he's making a policy argument. And, you know, that's something that the courts um, and lawyers who interpret courts don't really get involved in. That's a legislative matter. And um, those are issues that should be addressed um, with the policymakers. And I think you alluded to earlier that it, Congress could very well kind of uh, more specifically define these terms in the Clean Water Act. And uh, if they feel that the Supreme Court decided this incorrectly, if they feel that the Supreme Court tilted the scales a little bit more toward developers and, and more against wetlands, that they could kind of uh, codify that by uh, upgrading perhaps the Clean Water Act or at least defining some of the terms there, what might that look like? And and have you heard if there's an appetite in Congress for that? Uh, I have not heard whether there is or not. Um, I suspect that's something we'll start hearing more about. Um, at the decision, you know, it's only like a couple of weeks old, so it probably hasn't yet filtered down um, into the, into the, the uh, domain of Congress. But it, it, I think that an obvious fix um, that addresses Justice Kavanaugh's concern um, would be uh, to define adjacent uh, to be something more than just adjoining. And that would probably take some wordsmithing. But I think that to me, that's, that's a fairly um, clear uh, cure to the concern that uh, those four justices were expressing. I want to remind people that our guest is land use attorney Dave Smolker. We're talking about the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision on wetlands jurisdiction. It's called Sackett versus EPA. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And thanks to John and Palmetto for that phone call. I want to read this email that comes from Twinkle, who says, um, uh, your guests had an amazing summary. Thanks very much. I'm glad to hear that Florida seems to have good watershed protections in place. I do hope we can put a slowdown on development. Uh, so thank you for those words, Twinkle. And, um, you know, that, that brings me to the question, um, do you think that, to, Dave, to my guest Dave, do you think that this could mean more construction and development in Florida, I know that kind of across the country, you've mentioned that this might change the rules, but but specifically with Florida and how Florida has uh, more jurisdiction over wetlands than than some other states, could this mean more construction and more development? You know, that's a good question. Uh, my you know very preliminary analysis is it might because it would potentially streamline the regulatory approval process such that the DEP's current obligation to also enforce uh, the Federal Clean Water Act in addition to the Environmental Resource Permitting Program would be lifted with respect to wetlands that are no longer core jurisdictional. I think that really remains to be seen because as I said before, the state's Environmental Resource Protection regulation reaches these wetlands anyway. So I suspect maybe there'll be less for perhaps regulatory red tape as with regard to the wetlands that are now excluded. Um, in theory, that could make the permitting process less complicated. Uh, maybe it won't take so long. Uh, and that might lead to more rapid rate of development in Florida. But I think the jury's sort of out on that. I'm really kind of speculating here, um, but we'll just have to wait and see. How did we get to the point where Florida had this additional jurisdiction or at least these additional, um, uh, the ability to regulate wetlands that used to be or are in other states were regulated by the federal government? Uh, well, that, there's a history there and it actually kind of tracks the federal the, uh, uh, the the history of the federal assertion of jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act, the state um, kind of 
decided to sort of mirror um, with its own state regulatory program, um, the Clean Water Act. Um, it really, so they started out regulating wetlands at the state level in the mid 1970s. Um, that matured into um, both regulation of impacts to wetlands as, uh, and they always broadly defined wetlands. Uh, and that was fairly consistent with how the EPA and the Corps were interpreting wetlands. Uh, so they were kind of marching in tandem. Um, in, the, in the 1980s, uh, Florida uh, started regulating water qu quantity in addition to water quality. And so that added another layer of regulation. And then in the early 19, uh, and then I think in the late 80s, they started regulating isolated wetlands, um, which would currently not fall within federal jurisdiction in the Sackett case. Um, and then in the early 1990s, <laughs> they kind of revamped the whole regulatory scheme, created the environmental resource protection regulatory structure that dealt with both quantity and quality of water, as well as filling of wetlands. And that's been in place now since uh, the early 1990s. Um, but it's always been um, a, has a broader reach jurisdictionally uh, than the, the current Sackett decision would uh, have for federal jurisdiction. Our guest is Dave Smolker, land use attorney, and we're talking about the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision. It's called Sackett versus EPA. And a few years ago, Rick Scott's DEP secretary wrote to the EPA administrator, this was during the first year of the Trump administration, requesting an update to the definition of waters of the United States. So that get, gets back to the, the whole one of the whole questions in Sackett versus EPA. Um, the the uh, DEP secretary under Rick Scott said that the regulation of land and water is a traditional and primary power of the states. It invoked the Tenth Amendment on state sovereign authority, and he suggested the state could do a better job than the feds when it comes to water resources, pollution, and regulation. So, is is was that letter was that uh, petition? I guess to the EPA part of how Florida uh, got its um, you know, got the ability to regulate more of the wetlands. I think you're referring to the 2017 letter. Yes. <clears throat> no, actually, I think that was. Um, in connection with Florida's request to receive a delegation of authority to uh, implement and enforce um, the Clean Water Act um, in lieu of the EPA and the Corps of Engineers. And so I think that this particular letter was in support of the delegation, um, which did occur, um, at least as to um, most wetlands. So, uh, I think at that point in time, the environmental resource uh, permit regulatory structure was well in place and, very, and quite mature at that point. I have a question that came in from the from an emailer. His name is Greg, and he writes, the SCOTUS decision is a human rights violation. SCOTUS is taking human rights from a corporal, corporal with a body and granting them to fictitious corporate individuals. The decision will prevent us from preserving clean water and a livable earth. They're selling the ground from the feet of everyone forever. So uh, Greg is unhappy with the, the um, SCOTUS decision. Uh, I, any thoughts on on that on his his comments? Well, I I think it's he's exaggerating the effect of this decision. Sounds like based on political ideology, but I'm going to play a couple of minutes of uh, some of the arguments so people can kind of get an idea of in this Supreme Court case. It was. It happened on the oral argument. Happened on October third of last year, twenty twenty two. It happened to be the first time, the first oral arguments for the newest justice, Katanji Brown Jackson. And in this clip that I'm going to play, we'll hear conservative justice Brett Kavanaugh. He ultimately sided with the EPA, um, having uh, with with the idea that the EPA would have um, more power. Questions the attorney. He's questioning the attorney that was representing the Idaho landowners, Damian Schiff. He's the senior attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation. Again, you're listening to Tuesday Cafe coming to you from WMNF in Tampa. 
Here's Brett Kavanaugh and Damian Schiff arguing before the U.S. Supreme Court. You keep emphasizing the text, but you agree that some wetlands are covered as waters of the United States, correct? That is correct, Justice Kavanaugh. And so the question then becomes, as I see it, does the statute, does the text cover only bordering or contiguous wetlands, or does it also cover what we might call neighboring wetlands? Is that an appropriate way to phrase what you think the precise dispute is? Yes, that, that is correct. Okay, and on 404G, uh, which, as Justice Barrett says, is is critical here to on uh, the case, is your argument that 404G does not control or even illustrate what qualifies as waters of the United States, or is your argument that adjacent, the word in 404G, does not mean neighboring or nearby, but requires actual touching? Justice Kavanaugh, or I would, both. Just, I, I would say it's both. I would say, again, following precisely what Riverside Bay, which is essentially the, the zenith of, of this court's indulgence of, of EPA and the court's interpretation of the act. At most, Riverside Bayview was willing to say that 404G simply means that, well, we can't interpret waters to categorically exclude wetlands. And that's all that the court was willing to say. Once you get there, aren't you a little bit... Uh separated from the text as you see the text. In other words, I don't know that you really agree with Riverside Bayview when it comes down to it. You're not asking for it to be overruled. Well, Justice Kavanaugh, to be frank, we weren't all textualists then. But today... So, but then then you're asking us to put what you're calling a textual limit on something that's divorced from the text to begin with, it sounds to me like, rather than going with neighboring, which is the ordinary dictionary definition of adjacent, uh, uh, and also would, would well, keep, I'll leave it there. Well, Justice Kavanaugh, with respect to, to, to the ordinary understanding of adjacency, I certainly agree that in the abstract, adjacent has more than one meaning. But I do believe that in the context of 404G, where it's trying to describe relationships between topographic features that the most reasonable understanding, really the only plausible understanding, is that it means physically touching. Again, when you combine it with the fact that the central definitional section- Last question, why did seven straight administrations not agree with you? Well, I wouldn't quite say it's seven straight, at least the uh, under the Trump administration, their proposal was certainly closer to, to what- the No, and let's be clear. They said that it would still be covered even if it was separated by a berm or dune, for example. No, uh, that is correct. And, and under your test, that would not be covered. That is correct, Justice Kavanaugh. I don't presume to, to, to know more than, than those, those seven prior administrations, but what I do know is what is the text that Congress has used, and nothing can supersede that. Well, that was Damian Schiff, who is the senior attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation, essentially representing the Idaho landowners before the U.S. Supreme Court. He was being questioned by Justice Brett Kavanaugh. And I want to bring back my guest for commenting on that. My guest is Dave Smolker, a land use attorney. And we're talking about that recent U.S. Supreme Court decision, Sackett versus EPA. So again, the, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of the definitions and, and um, Kavanaugh's kind of uh, being a little bit nervous that uh, that they they were they might be excluding some waters that should be regulated by the EPA. Yes, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think Justice Kavanaugh and the other justices have a very valid point. Uh, and when you're getting into a, a term that has multiple dispositive uh, plain meanings, you run into this particular situation and. Um, I do think that um, that they they have a valid point, um, and uh, ultimately, based on the majority's decision, it's going to be a question of either how do you interpret uh, the opinion of the justices in a way that could um, get to these berms and adjacent river berms and dunes and things of that nature that separate. Uh, wetlands from navigable waters, or ultimately it's probably a question for Congress uh, to answer. Uh, we're just gonna have to wait and see. 
You know, I, th I think that um, it's kind of a good exercise to hear how some of the arguments go in these cases, uh, how, how the what it sounds like to listen to the Supreme Court. We don't get to hear it very often. And since, uh, you know, we've had so much background, you've brought us so much background about this case. I want to listen to another clip of, of uh, some of the uh, justices and what their questions were. So I am going to play this clip and we'll talk about it afterwards. Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson is questioning Fletcher, who is Br Brian Fletcher, the principal deputy solicitor general of the U.S. Department of Justice. So he was defending the EPA's uh, uh, scope of their jurisdiction here. And several several other justices are going to weigh in on this clip. We're going to hear Samuel Alito, Amy Coney Barrett, and Sonia Sotomayor. So let's listen to this clip, and we'll bring my guests back in to, to talk about it in just a couple of minutes. Again, you're listening to Tuesday Cafe from WMNF in Tampa. I just wanted to follow up um, on Justice Gorsuch's very fair points, which were my points. How do, how do people know? Is there a process by which a homeowner can ask? Yes. Uh, any homeowner can ask the Corps for a jurisdictional determination. The Corps makes those available free of charge. And so you're not really facing criminal liability without the opportunity to get an assessment from the government regarding your particular circumstances. That's correct. All right. And what happens if this, uh, if the uh, the government's determination uh, based on this multi-factor test is that uh, you can't develop your property? Then what recourse does the homeowner have? The homeowner can challenge that determination. If we're talking about a determination that you can't develop, that wouldn't just be a jurisdictional determination. That would have to also be a permitting decision because yeah, just being okay. covered but doesn't mean you can't What develop. if the homeowner doesn't agree with the jurisdictional decision? This court's decision in Hawks makes clear that the homeowner can seek judicial review of that at that point without potentially incurring any, any penalties can challenge the jurisdictional determination there and can also seek a permit. You know, and that is I think it's important to emphasize just again that being covered by the Clean Water Act doesn't mean no development. It means review. And the Corps have have taken a lot of steps at the Congress's behest to streamline the process through the availability of nationwide permits for things like road construction, uh, for the development of dams, for single family homes construction. Uh, in but the site to... specific, which is applicable to the sackets, you don't dispute in your brief that that can cost hundreds of thousand dollars and be years and years. It's just the general permitting that gets you out of that and gets you in the $14,000 range in the shorter time. Period. So we think the several hundred thousand dollars is exaggerated for the site specific permits as well. The same source that we cite on page 37 of our brief for the four to $14,000 for nationwide permits gives numbers of 17,000 to $35,000 as the site usual specific. cost for site specific. That's right. And it's, it's also important to recognize that those site specific permits often involve much bigger projects that could be major developments spanning many, many acres. So that's the agency's best estimate of the cost of a typical. So Rapanos was just wrong in it, citing that statistic. In our view, that, that statistic is not consistent with the best information we have now. And that's from the 2021 regulatory impact analysis of the reissuance of the nationwide permits. Your, your adversary, the other side, I shouldn't call them adversary, your, the other side argued that Mr. Sackett could not tell this was a marshland. Is that true? Because you said the first thing is it has to be a wetland. So I, I don't know what Mr. Sackett could tell, and I don't want to speak to that. What I can speak to is what's in the record, which is communications from the Army Corps to the prior owner in 1996 saying this is a jurisdictional wetland. You would need a permit to build. Here's information about how to seek nationwide permits. And we also have the pictures of the property that are at Petition Appendix 37 to 39 and also in the Joint Appendix. Now, we don't have pictures before it was filled in with gravel, but the pictures after it was filled in with gravel show that the parts that are not filled with gravel have standing water in them. Uh, and also the Sackett's own environmental consultant who came and looked at the property confirmed the Corps' judgment that these are wetlands. I think it's, it's also worth emphasizing that although they're now separated by the larger fen across the street by Kalispell Bay Road, historically before the road was built, that wasn't true. It was all part of one wetlands complex and the whole fin drained down through the Sackett's property and into to Priest Lake. Is it Council possible? Go ahead. I, just one last question, uh, and borrowing from just, just what Justice Kagan did before. As you can probably tell, some of my colleagues are dubious that this is precise enough definition adjacency to survive. So is there another test, not the Rapanos test, not the adjacency test, not the significant nexus test, but is there another test that could be um, 
more precise and less open-ended than the adjacency test or the significant nexus test that you use? Is there some sort of connection that could be articulated? So I'd say a couple things about that. I'd say, first of all, that if you're in that world, you're past the sort of line drawing problem or the notion that wetlands aren't really waters and so are only covered if they're indistinguishable. And instead, we're making a judgment about which wetlands are appropriate to cover because exactly. of their effect. Now, there are different ways to draw that line. Justice Kennedy articulated the significant nexus test. But, that's, but that's when it's not adjacent, correct? That's when it's not adjacent to a traditional navigable water. That right. does apply. I want to go because we seem to be searching for wetlands adjacent. So let's right. stick to that. Right. So for wetlands adjacent, if you want a, a sort of crisper, clearer definition of adjacent, I, as I think my colloquy with Justice Gorsuch illustrates, I think it's difficult to say that there's one single bright line answer. The agencies are taking comment on this and are considering whether there are things that they could do to provide greater clarity to the regulated public on all parts of the test, including adjacency and significant nexus. The 2015 rule, as we discussed, tried to draw some bright line rules. Those were criticized as arbitrary and over-inclusive, which is the problem with bright line rules that be over-inclusive or under-inclusive, but I certainly think there is a range of reasonable understandings of what adjacency means. That's Brian Fletcher, the Principal Deputy Solicitor General from the U.S. Department of Justice in October of 2022 at the U.S. Supreme Court being questioned by, uh, we heard Sonia Sotomayor, Amy Coney Barrett, Samuel Alito, and Justice Katanji Brown-Jackson in her first oral arguments and we're talking, this was in the case Sackett versus EPA. The decision was released just a couple of weeks ago about wetlands and jurisdiction about um, regulating wetlands. And I want to remind people that my guest is Dave Smolker, a land use attorney. And we've been talking about Sackett versus EPA. So anything in that clip that we just heard that that you'd like to kind of um, reiterate any of the points about as before we end the show? Yeah, several. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I think Justice Barrett was underscoring the practical problem for a homeowner like the Sacketts who uh, want to build a single family home on, uh, on some property in Idaho that has uh, wetlands on it, and they, they want to fill it in so that they can, they can have a home. And the notion that they could be subject to sort of open-ended um, significant nexus factors in determining whether it was core jurisdictional or not, and the potential time and expense associated with having to get a permit, um, coupled with the risk associated with not getting a permit and potentially um, being subjected to civil and criminal penalties, uh, all sort of underscores to me the importance of having a clear definition. And ultimately, it really has to go back to the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which uh, is the basis for federal jurisdiction over wetlands, which is interstate commerce. And, you know, in the final analysis, um, I, I do think ultimately you have to look back to say, all right, is, is when the Sackets were filling their wetland, was that having any impact on interstate commerce? And I think under a, a, a fairly arguably strict interpretation of that, you would have to say no. And so that should be, to me, a common sense approach to dealing with the problem. The line drawing is very difficult. Um, and as I said earlier, I think that the justices were wrestling with the line drawing and um, there were five justices who felt that they could draw the line at adjoining uh, as opposed to nearby. The question then is, you know, where do we go from here um, in light of the fact that Justice Kavanaugh did raise some valid points? Uh, maybe not a problem in Florida so much, but it could well be a problem in other states that may not already have their regulatory uh, jurisdictions over wetlands in place. So uh, I have to leave it there as we come to the end of the show, but I want to thank you very much for coming on Tuesday Cafe, Dave. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm glad you could come on. Dave Smolker is a land use attorney, and we've been talking about the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision, Sackett versus EPA.
Thanks to our phone screener, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint and we'll continue the discussion about water in Florida next on Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. Their guests are from Florida Springs Council. This is WMNF Tampa.